Welcome back to our class, and we're going to begin a brand new subject here. We're looking at Romans chapter 1. We'll be looking at Romans 1. That'll be the first four chapters in the book of Romans. That's 16 chapters. So this will be BI 338A. And I want to address a couple of issues as we begin to embark upon this journey together. First of all, you'll have a six-page uh, a syllabus that is going to be assigned to you in addition to a number of documents that you will be required to download what their various teaching notes. And I want you to note in your six-point, uh, six-page syllabus is a very detailed syllabus along with a reading assignment, and you'll have two books to be looking at. Number one, the first book is Romans, verse by verse by, by William R. Nelwell. You will be required to do a lot of reading out of that book. And the second book will be The Righteousness, The Righteous Shall Live by Faith, and that's the book of Romans by R.C. Sproul. Each week you have a reading assignment on two books in addition to the handouts that you will be receiving. And I want to draw your attention to that because this course requires a lot of reading. In addition to that, when you look at the exams, the exams require that you do a lot of writing as well. I don't typically give yes and no questions as, for, as an exam. It does require you to think your answers through and to write them out. And so I want to draw that, your attention to that specifically. You have a lot of reading. I will not be going through the textbooks per se. I have a lot of other additional material that I will be sharing with you in the lectures in that the books will speak for themselves, the material in the books will speak for themselves. So I want to draw and try to draw out a much broader perspective uh, and so that you can have a broader, a, a much broader understanding of the book of Romans specifically in BI 338 a, that is, that will be the first four chapters of the book of Romans. This course is four courses. As you see, we will split up the 16 chapters of the book of Romans, four in each class. We'll begin together, and we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 1, so please be so kind. Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 1, and let's look at the first seven verses together. Paul, a bond servant a slave, a doulos of Christ Jesus called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all of the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In my intro introductory remarks, I want to draw your attention as to some of the inf some of the significance of this particular epistle and some of the background information so that we have a better handle on how we approach the book of Romans. If you were to uh, take away the entire Bible, the Old Testament from my possession and including the New Testament and to leave me with one option as to which book I could be allowed to be remain with, it would be the book of Romans. Romans will be the treatise of the New Testament. There is so much information in the book of Romans it, it really refers back much to the, out, throughout the Old Testament as well as throughout the New Testament. In addition, Book of Romans also is rich theologically and doctrinally. There is more than enough information in the Book of Romans alone to be able to sustain me for a lifetime. And as we begin to embark upon the book of Romans, my goal is always to have a deep fellowship with the Lord and the understanding of his word and out of that experience to explain to his people what a passage means. In the words of the book of Nehemiah in chapter 8, verse 8, 
He said, I strive to give the sense of it so that they may truly hear God speak and in, and, and in so doing may respond to him. In Nehemiah, I'm reading out of the New American Standard Version of the Bible. You have, of course, in the class, we have so many different, different versions of the Bible. But I want to draw your attention at least to this version. It says this, they read from the book from the law of God, translating to give the sense so that they may understand the reading. In Nehemiah, the Amplified Version says this, So they read from the book of the law of God distinctly, faithfully, amplifying and giving the sense so that the people understood the reading. That's exactly what the goal will be in going through in the next four classes, in the, next, uh, in the book of Romans, so that we have an understanding of the sense what is actually being said to us as opposed to what the popular church, cultural church has indicated that it says. Obviously, God's people need to understand him which demands knowing his word of truth. And that's what the Bible tells us in the second book of Timothy, chapter 2 and verse 15, tells us be diligent to present yourselves. That is a requirement from God to all of us. Approved, he says, to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed accurately handling the word of truth. In the book of Colossians, Paul says this in chapter 3 in verse 16, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonition, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. I also want to draw your attention that the dominant thrust of my ministry, and it should be so for everybody's ministry, okay, is therefore to help make people, make God's people, uh, and make uh, the God's living word alive to all of his people. As we begin to unpack this, I want you to know, understand some of the background and the richness of the book of Romans itself. And most of all, most if not all, of the great revivals and the reformations in the history of the church have been directly related to the book of Romans. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. In September of the year of our Lord in 386 AD, a native of North Africa who had been a professor for several years in Milan, Italy, sat weeping in the garden of his friend, Alpheus, at contem contemplating the wickednesses of his life. And so there he, was, he, there he was in a state of anxiety and depressed, realizing that he truly was a wicked man and yet he was teaching the word of God. While sitting there, he heard a child singing in the Latin language, tololege, tololege, which in Latin means take up and read, take up and read. A an open scroll of the book of Romans laid beside him and he picked it up. And the first passage that caught his eye, we read in the book of Romans in chapter 13, in verses 13 and 14. It says this, let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and in jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. And here we have this man reading these verses and it grips his heart out of the book of Romans. The man later wrote of that occasion, this is what he said, No further would I read, nor did I need, for instantly as the sentence ended, by a light as it were, or security infused into my heart, all of the gloom of doubt vanished away. Who was this person and who was this man? The man was Aurelius Augustine who upon reading that short passage from the book of Romans received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and went on to become one of the church's outstanding theologians and leaders of his day by reading the book of Romans. And just over a thousand years later, Martin Luther, a monk of the Roman Catholic order named after Augustine, was teaching the book of Romans to his students at the University of Wittenberg in the country of Germany. And as he carefully studied the text, he became more and more convicted by Paul's central theme of justification by faith alone. And here's what he wrote. 
I greatly longed to understand Paul's epistle to the Romans, and nothing stood in the way but that one expression, the righteousness of God. Why? Because I took it to mean that the righteous whereby God is righteous and deals righteously in punishing the unrighteous. Night and day I pondered until I grasped the truth. The truth that the righteousness of God is that righteousness whereby through grace and sheer mercy he justifies us by faith. Thereupon, Martin Luther continues to write, I felt, I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into, into paradise. The whole of Scripture took on a new meaning, whereas before the righteousness of God had filled me with hate, now it became to me inexpressibly sweet in greater love. This passage of Paul became to me a gateway to heaven. And this is how he came to know Jesus Christ, by reading the book of Romans. Several centuries later, an ordained minister in the Church of England by the name of John Wesley was similarly confused about the meaning of the gospel and was searching for genuine experience of salvation. So it takes us to Wednesday night on the May 24th in the year of our Lord of 1738. He wrote in his journal, he wrote this, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. So he goes into this, into this Bible study, into this prayer meeting, and someone is reading the preface to the book of Romans that Martin Luther had written several hundred years before. And note what he says, in about a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt that I did trust in Christ and Christ alone for my salvation and the assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. So here you have these great men in the history of the church who had already been in the ministry, had been in the, in the church of the living God, teaching the word of God, and yet had not come to the salvation knowledge of Jesus Christ, except if it were, if it were for not be the book of Romans itself. In assessing the importance of the book of Romans, John Calvin said this, when anyone gains a knowledge of this epistle, the book of Romans, he has entrance open to him to all who most hidden treasures of all of the scriptures. Martin Luther said that the Roman is the chief part of the New Testament and the very purest of all gospel. Frederick Goddard, the noted Swiss Bible commentator, called Romans the cathedral of Christian faith. In the famous 16th century Bible translator, William Tyndale, this great Bible translator, William Tyndale, wrote the following words in his preface to the book of Romans. Listen to what he says. For as much as this epistle is the principal and the most excellent part of the New Testament and the most pure evangelion, that it is to say, glad tidings that we all call gospel, that we call gospel and, all, and also a light and a way unto the whole of Scripture. I think it meet that every Christian man not only know it by rote and without the book, but also exercise himself therein ever more continually as with the daily bread of the soul. No man verily can read it too oft or to study it too well, for the more it is studied, the easier it is. The more it is chewed, the pleasanter it is. And the more groundly it is searched, the preciouser things are found in it. So great a treasure of spiritual things lieth hid they're in. The popular Bible expositor, Donald Gray Barnhouse, and he broadcast for 11 years of weekly messages on the book of Romans, wrote regarding this beloved epistle. This is what he says. A scientist may say that the mother's milk is the most perfect food known to man and may give you an analysis showing all of its chemical components a list of the vitamins it contains and an estimate of the calories in a given quantity. A baby will take that milk without the remotest knowledge of its content and will grow day by day, smiling and thriving in its ignorance. So it is with the profound truths of the Word of God.
It has been said that the Romans will delight the greatest log logician and captivate the mind of the consummate genius, yet it will bring tears to the humblest soul and refreshment to the simplest of minds. I will knock you down and then lift you up. It, it, it will strip you naked and then clothe you with eternal elegance. The Book of Romans took a Bedford tinker like John Bunyan and turned him into the spiritual giant that literary and literary master who wrote the Pilgrim's Progress and the Holy War. This epistle, the Book of Romans, quotes the Old Testament 57 times, more than any other New Testament book. It repeatedly uses key words such as God itself 154 times. It uses the word law, the law of God, 77 times. It talks about Christ 66 times. It mentions sin 45 times. It talks, it mentions the Lord 44 times. And it talks about faith, it mentions faith 40 times. Romans, my friend, is a rich book. You not need have to understand everything commencing its study, but it will richly, it would richly endow you just as the milk of a mother to a newborn babe. Romans answers many questions concerning man and God, and some of the most significant questions it answers. And note these questions with me. What is the good news of God? Is Jesus really God? What is God like? How can God send people to hell? Why do men reject God and his son Jesus Christ? Why are there false religions and idols? What is man's biggest sin? Why are there six sex perversions and hatred and crime and dishonesty and all the other evils in the world? And why are they so pervasive and rampant? What is the standard by which God condemns people? How can a person who has never heard the gospel be held spiritually responsible? Do Jews have a greater responsibility to believe than Gentiles? Who is a true Jew? Is there any spiritual advantage to being Jewish? How good is man in himself? How evil is man in himself? Can any person keep God's law perfectly? How can a person know he is a sinner? How can, how, 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 how can a sinner be forgiven and be justified by God? How is a Christian related to Abraham? What is the importance of Christ's death? What is the importance of his resurrection? What is the importance of his present life in heaven? For whom did Christ die? Where can man find real peace and hope? We, how are all men related spiritually to Adam? And how are believers related to spiritually to Jesus Christ? What is grace and what does it do? How are God's grace and God's laws even related? How does a person die spiritually and become reborn? What is the Christian's relationship to sin? How important is obedience in the Christian life? Why is living a faithful Christian life such a great struggle? How many natures does a Christian truly have? And still we have more questions. What does the Holy Spirit do for a believer? How intimate is a Christian relationship to God? Why is there even suffering? Will the world ever be different? What are election and what is predestination? How can Christians pray properly? How, is, how secure is a believer's salvation? What is God's present plan for Israel? What is, his future, what is the future plan for Israel? Why and for what have the Gentiles been chosen by God? What is the Christian's responsibility to Jews and to Israel? What is true spiritual commitment? What is the Christian's relationship to the world in general, to the unsaved and to other Christians and to human government? What is genuine love and how does it even work? How do Christians deal with issues that are right, that are neither right nor wrong in themselves? What is true freedom? How important is there is unity in the church itself? It is just absolutely incredible that the book of Romans begins to answer every single one of these questions. It's no wonder why that Swiss great Bible theologian and commentator Frederick got it. He said this, O St. Paul, had thy work been to compose the epistle to the Romans, that alone should have rendered thee, thee, thee dear to every sound reason itself. Romans speaks to us today just as powerfully as it spoke to the men of the first century of their era. It speaks morally about adultery, fornication, homosexuality, hating, murder, lying, and civil disobedience. 
It also speaks intellectually, telling us the natural man is confused because he has a reprobate mind. In addition, it speaks socially, telling us how we are to relate to one another. In addition, it speaks psychologically, telling us where true freedom comes to deliver men from the burden of guilt. It also speaks nationally, telling us our responsibility to human government. It also speaks internationally, telling us the ultimate destiny of the earth and especially of the future of Israel. It also speaks spiritually, answering man's despair by offering hope for the future. It speaks theologically, teaching us the relationship between the flesh and the spirit, between law and grace, between works and faith. It also, but most of all, it profoundly brings God himself to us. I want to draw your attention to this last section. An anonymous poet wrote these moving words that capture much of the heart of the book of Romans. We don't know who wrote it, but listen to it. Oh, long and dark the stairs I trod, with trembling feet to find my God, gaining a foothold a bit by bit, then slipping back and losing it, never progressing, striving still, with weakening grasp and faltering will. Serenely smiled, unknown, undotting me, bleeding a climb to God while he be. Then, then came a certain time when I loosened my hole and fell thereby, down to the lowest step my fall, and as if not, not climbed at all, now where I laid despairing there, listened to a foothold, to a footfall on the stair, and on that same stair where I afraid, faltered and fell and laid and dismayed. O oh Lord, and he says, and O oh Lord, when hope and cease to be, my God came down to stairs to be. I want to draw your attention, and I want you to understand the book of Romans is perhaps one of the richest books that you're ever going to read. So many of us have taken this book for granted. So many of us have just passed by it, only looking for, ni- for little nippets by which that we can quote a verse here and there. But the book of Romans answers all of these concerns and all of these questions, and the book of Romans will truly challenge who you are in your walk with Christ as an individual. The book of Romans is so rich that it took Donald Gray Barnhouse 11 years to preach through this book in his church and on radio. Imagine, imagine the richness of the book and how much we will not be able to cover in one semester alone. So I want to draw your attention to what I said to you at the outset. You have a great deal of reading to do in two books, one by Dr. Nelwell, one by Dr. Sproul, in addition to all of my additional handouts that you will be required to read. And yes, and perhaps you will go blind in this class. But I want to draw your attention. You will be blind, but you will be filled with the knowledge of the Word of God. And so with that in mind, I wish you well as we embark together in this great book, the book of Romans, because God is faithful. He has always been faithful. And remember this, he came from heaven to reach us. We no longer have to strive to reach him. So I draw your attention to the riches of this great book. As Augustine, Aurelius Augustine discovered, tololege, tololege, pick it up and read it. Pick it up and read it. Welcome back. This will be lecture one, part two. Let's return to now to Romans chapter one, looking in the first seven verses. And as I had mentioned in our last class, I'm only going to focus on things that you will not be covering in your readings, in your various readings. In addition to, I will be giving you a lot of additional material to read from our lecture notes. I'm just going to be highlighting quickly through Romans one, one through seven. Paul, a bond servant, devoted, slave, because that's what, that's what this is talking about, the word doulas, which means slave of Christ Jesus, called and as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, 
who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to see this with me in this introductory remark, and that is that no person is a true follower, nobody, of Jesus Christ unless he is enslaved by Christ. And this is the first thing we note in Romans chapter 1, right at the beginning, when he says, Paul, a bondservant, Paul, a doulos, D-O-U-L-O-S, which is the Greek word for slave, a slave, a bondservant, a devoted slave of Jesus Christ. The fact... In fact, it is impossible for a person to belong to Christ unless he is enslaved by Christ. This is the shocking message that Paul wants to get across to the believers at Rome. And the first thing that I want to focus in here is that he was a slave of Christ. Secondly, he was an apostle of God. Third, he was set apart to the gospel of God. If you see this with me here. And fourth, he received God's grace and God's mission. And fifth, he acknowledged the enslavement of others. I just want to focus in on the first part of this, and that is Paul, a doulos, a slave, a bond servant of Christ, in verse 1, called as an apostle set apart for the gospel of God. Now the word slave is the word doulos in Greek, and in, in the Hebrew language is ebed, E-B-E-D, ebed, and it means far more than just a servant. It means a slave totally possessed by the master. It is a bond servant bound to law, bound by law to a master. I belong to Christ. I am no longer free on my own. Jesus purchased me. Purchased me from the bondages of my sin where I was completely separated from him. So this word doulos, a bond servant, the common New Testament word for servant, although in the Greek culture it is most often referred to as involuntary permanent service of a slave. Paul, what he does, something is completely the opposite of what the Greek culture understood to be a slave. What he does, he elevates this term. He elevates this concept he, by using it in the Hebrew sense, ebed, to describe a servant who willingly commits himself to serve a master he loves and that he respects. And I'm going to show you this. In the book of Exodus, in chapter 21, and if you recall, in the last class we had mentioned that the book of Romans quotes the Old Testament 57 times, quite extensively, in fact, more than any other New Testament book. In the book of Exodus, chapter 21, look with me, verse 5 and 6. Again, we're focusing just in on the very first part of the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 1. And when he says very clearly here, he says, a bond, Paul, a bondservant, a slave of Jesus Christ, or of Christ Jesus. Now, in, in Exodus 21, verse 5 and 6 says, But if the slave plainly, and remember, I'm reading out of the New American Standard Version, so it depends on what version you're reading, says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, and I will not go out as a free man. Then his master shall bring him to God, and then he shall bring him to the door of the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, with an awl and he will serve him permanently. So what he would do is the slave said, I don't seek to be free. I choose to spend the rest of my days here. I've married my wife here. I have my children here, and, and we are your property, but I'm being set free. My wife and children cannot go, and I I now willingly will serve as a slave so that I may have my family with me. And so he takes him before God. The slave makes an oath to God that he will be, he will be the slave to this particular master. And then the master takes him to the doorpost and takes his ear, his earlobe, and stretches it out onto the doorpost and puts a spike right through it onto the doorpost and nails his ear right to it. And he's got this big old hole there, okay? Pulls it out eventually, of course. Okay? And that indicates that he now belongs to this household. Jesus Christ, the holes in his hands, are proof that we belong to him and him alone.
In the book of Galatians, in chapter 1, he tells us in verse 10 this concept. For I am now seeking the favor, for he says, for I am now seeking the favor of men or of God. He's asking a question. It's, a, it's obviously a rhetorical question, that needs to, but it does require an answer. And he says, or am I striving to please men? Another, another question. He says, if I were still lo- trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant, a slave of Christ. In the book of Titus, in chapter 1, verse 1, says this, Paul, a slave, a bondservant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge and the truth, which is according to what? To godliness. Again, let's return to the Old Testament. In the book of Genesis, in chapter 26, and verse 24, it says this. It says, The Lord appeared to him in the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear for I, am, for I am with you, I will bless you and multiply your descendants for the sake of my, what? Servant Abraham, my abed, my slave Abraham. In the book of Numbers, in chapter 12, verse 7, he says, Not so with my abed, Moses, my servant Moses, he is faithful in all my household. What about Second Samuel, chapter 7, verse 5? where he says, go and say to my abed, my servant David, thus says the Lord, are you the one who should build me a house to dwell in? What about Isaiah chapter 53 verse 11? Says this, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge, the righteous, the righteous one, my abed, my slave, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. A look at the slave market of Paul's day shows more clearly what Paul meant when he said he was a slave of Jesus Christ. Now I want you to put yourself back into the first century. Go back to the days when Jesus walked this earth. The slave was owned by his master. He was totally possessed by his master. This is what Paul meant. Paul was purchased and possessed by Christ. Christ had looked upon him and had seen him degraded and need and in and in a needful condition. And when Christ looked, and the most wonderful thing happened, Christ loved him and bought him purchased him. Therefore, he was now the possession of Christ, exactly precisely what he did for each and every single one of us who are here. Secondly, the slave existed for his master, and he had no other reasons for existence. We exist for Christ and Christ alone. He had no personal rights whatsoever. I don't have any rights. My rights are in Christ Jesus. The same was true with Paul. He existed only for his rights, were the rights of Christ only. Third, the slave served his master, and he existed only for the purpose of service. That's my only existence. I exist for the purpose of service, service in the kingdom of God. He was at the master's disposal at any hour of the day or night. So it was with Paul. He lived only to serve Christ hour by hour, day by day, night by night. It should be so with us today. Fourth, the slave's will belonged to his master. My will belongs to my master. He was allowed no will and no ambition other than the will and the ambition of the master. He was completely subservient to the master and owed total obedience to the will of the master. Paul belonged to Christ. In fact, he said that he fought and struggled. In 2 Corinthians in chapter 10, we're told this in verse 5. 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says, to bring every thought every thought into captivity to the obedience of whom? Of Christ. Fifth, there is a fifth and most precious thing that Paul meant by a slave of Jesus Christ. He meant that he had the highest and the most honored and kingly profession in all of the world. Men, 
of God, the greatest men of history. The believer's slavery to Jesus Christ is no cringing, cowardly, or shameful position of subjection. It is the position of honor, the honor that bestows upon a man the privileges and the responsibilities of serving King, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords, and that is Jesus Christ. So when we read in Romans chapter 1, where he says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ, called an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. This is not a lowly position. This is a position of great honor that is bestowed upon every single one of us as sons and daughters of God. Moses was a slave of God. We know that to be true. Joshua was a slave of God. We know that to be true. David was a slave of God. We know that to be true. James, Paul was a slave of Jesus Christ. We know that to be true. James was a slave of Jesus Christ. We know that to be true. Peter was a slave of Jesus Christ. We know that to be true. Jude was a slave of Jesus Christ. We know that to be true. The prophets were slaves of God. We know that to be true. Christian believers are said to be the slaves of Jesus Christ as well. And I want to draw your attention to that as well. And I look at this with me and go to the book of Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and verse 18, please. He says, Even are my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Here we have in Acts chapter 2 verse 18, the first Christian sermon is being preached by Peter, and he quotes Joel the prophet, and he says this, even of my bond slaves, he's talking about my doulas, my, in the Hebrew is my abeds, in the Greek text is doulas. And he's talking about both men and women. He's talking about the believers. We are slaves of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 also tells us this. He says in verse 22, 1 Corinthians 7, 22 says, For he was called in the Lord while, what? A slave is the Lord's freeman. Likewise, he was also called while free is Christ's slave. In Ephesians 6, 6 says this, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from what? From the heart. In Colossians 4.12, he tells us, Epaphras, who was one of your number, a what? A bond slave, a doulos of Jesus Christ sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers, that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. Second Timothy chapter 2 also tells us in verse 24, the Lord's bondservant, the Lord's doulos, the Lord's ebbet, the Lord's slave, if you will, must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all and be able to teach and patient when wrong. He's talking about all those, all of us have been called into the ministry of Jesus Christ. So I want you to understand that. The great theologian and commentator William Barclay, in his letter to the Romans, and, and, and note what he says. And note and I want you to and I want you to see this with me in the and 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 he draws he draws attention to all of this as Christian believers and this is what he's talking about here and all these verses that I happen to finish quoting to you. Also, in addition, I want to draw your attention to John chapter twelve. In the book of John chapter twelve, verse twenty six says this: If anyone serves me, he must follow me where I am. There, my what? My doulos, my servant. My slave will all will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. In the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to, be, to present your bodies as a living and a holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, acceptable to God which is your spiritual service, he says, of worship. We're also told in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in that great in that great chapter of the resurrection and the great presentation of the gospel itself. In 1 Corinthians 15:58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, 
be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain and in the Lord. Again, in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, go back there with me. Look what he says in Ephesians 6, 6 and 7. Laboring. In other words, not by way of eye service as men pleases, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Amen? He says, with good will render service as to the Lord and not to men. Again, in Colossians, he says this in verse 23 and 24. He says, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Right? A verb of this concept of doulos of a slave. In Hebrews 12, 28, he says, Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may what? Offer what? Service to God and acceptable service with reverence and awe. In Exodus 23, 25 in the Old Testament says, But you shall serve the verb of abed. He says, the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will remove sickness from your midst. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12 says, Now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him. And notice this, and to serve, a verb, the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. With all your soul. Psalm chapter 2 verse 11 says, worship, here the word here is serve the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Also in Psalm, we're told in Psalm 100 in verse 2, serve the Lord with gladness, come before him with joyful singing. So here Paul begins to lay out for us this concept. First of all, the very first concept that we get out of the book of Romans, if anything else that you learn out of this class, will be that we are doulos, we are slaves, we are belong to Christ and to Christ alone. Secondly, as we return back to verse 1, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle. Now look at this. He's called as an apostle. Look at this. The word apostle, apostolos, in the Greek, means either a person who is sent out or a person who is sent forth. An apostle is what? He's a representative, an ambassador, a person who is sent out into one country to represent another country. Not like much of what's taking place today in much of the modern church. These were very specific individuals called at a very specific time for a very specific purpose. In the New Testament, it primarily refers to the 12 men of Christ chose to do what? To accompany him. We see that in the book of Mark in chapter 3. And if you look at that, verses 13 to 19. And, and in addition to that, we know that Matthias was included in that, whom the other apostles chose to replace who? Judas, right? We see that in the book of Acts in chapter 1, verses 15 to 26. Now, Christ gave these apostles very specific things. He gave them power to confirm their apostleship with what? With miracles. We see that in the book of Matthew in chapter 10 in verse 2. We also see it in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 12. And the authority to do what? To speak as his proxies, as his representatives. Every New Testament book was written either by an apostle or under his auspices, under the auspices of one of the apostles. We see that clearly in the book of John in chapter 14 verse 26. Now their teaching is the foundation of the church. We know that to be true. The apostles teaching is the foundation of the church because that is what's clearly told to us in the book of Ephesians in chapter 2 and verse 20. It says having been built on what? On the foundation of the apostles and prophets Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. 
Christ himself selected for this position, selected Paul for this position. We know that very clearly. Paul was selected by Jesus Christ personally right? and trained him to fulfill this ministry. Now, there are three things that are true of the apostles, okay? Three things. Number one, he belongs to the one who has sent him out. Number two, he is commissioned to be sent out. And number three, he possesses all authority and the power of, of the one who sends him out. So I want you to note these three things with me. Paul said he was called to be an apostle. He was not in the ministry because he, A, number one, chose to be. Two, because he had the ability. Three, had been encouraged by others to choose the, the ministerial profession. And fourth, enjoy working with people. No, he was an apostle, a minister of the gospel for one reason only. God had called him. Let me give you an example. In the book of Acts, chapter 9, verse 15. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is chosen an instrument of mine to bear what? To bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the sons of Israel. Again, in Acts 22, verse 14, says this. And he said, The God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his mouth. Acts 26, 16 says, But get up and stand on your feet. For the purpose I, the Lord, have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness. This is God speaking to Paul, not only the things which you have seen, but also the things in which I will appear to you. In Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, he acknowledges, Paul, an apostle, not sent from men nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. There is no commissioning agency in any church in any place in the world that can commission you and anoint you as an apostle it can only come directly from God and God alone in Galatians 1 12 it says for neither I received it from man nor was I taught it but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ which was affirmed and confirmed in the scriptures in addition he says in Galatians 1 16 to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. So I want to draw your attention that he is an apostle. He tells us in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, a Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, calls an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. And so as you begin to lay out and study this, in the first seven verses of the book of Romans in chapter 1, I have so much additional material to give to you. You need to look at that and study it out very carefully.